Hi there, guys. How are you? This is Muhammad Musa from AFK Study Plan. Today is Sunday, our weekly newsletter. As always, you can check the tags for the question from down here. Left side, you can check the previous newsletter. Upper right corner, you can click the clip to download the PDF file. Feel free to share the video, share the PDF file. Give me your feedback. That being said, let's begin. First question from X-Ray. A calcified mass, which is longitudinal in shape, is seen on a radiograph near the third and fourth cervical vertebrae. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? And this topic um, has been asked a lot in the previous, uh, in the last few cycles. So let's discuss it in details so you can get the concept and then it will be easy for you to answer any question. So here, all the calcified mass you can see in uh, a panoramic X-ray. We're gonna discuss each one and how to deal with each one. Let's start with antrolith, this one. Antrolith is calcified mass within the maxillary sinus, not attached to the sinus floor. And this is extremely important because Later, you would see a cal like radio-opaque mass inside the sinus, but with different diagnosis. So this one, not attached to the sinus, is very important for this one. Solitary or multiple, roughly spherical, well-defined radio-opacity, range from faint to densely radio-opaque with a laminated appearance. Laminated appearance, not attached to the sinus floor, this is very important. Often asymptomatic and require no treatment, okay? Maybe associated with chronic sinusitis could relate with symptoms. Okay, so you might see this inside the pan for your patient, uh, routine exam, you're doing the pan for him and you see it, no, no treatment unless your patient has chronic sinusitis, maybe you can, uh, you, you need to interfere with this. Second is tonsillitis. Tonsillitis is calcification within the tonsillar crypts. You would see it as a radio opacity here coming to the ramus of the mandible. Here you can see the approximate location and here where you are going to see it. It's not one, it will be multiple coming to this area. Single or multiple, round or irregular shape, radio opacity, maybe unilateral or bilateral, no treatment if asymptomatic. Again, most of these uh, require no treatment, but some of those are extremely dangerous and you need to take care of those, okay? Third one is sialolith. Sialolith, here you can see the approximate rotation almost like the entire ramus angle of the mandible even until to the uh, mental foramen. Why? Because this one is a calcification happening inside the uh, salivary gland. Some mandibular more than barotid, more the sublingual. So here you would see it for the barotid one. Here maybe for a barotid one, like barotid is like um, opposing to upper seven, we do it doing bands, so it will be maybe drifting here or here. Here you are having for the submandibular one, here for sublingual one. So that's why we have multiple location for it. It's a calcified mass within the duct organelle tissue of the salivary gland. It's well defined, round, smooth to a regular radio opacity, lamellar uh, or onion like appearance, maybe laminated or maybe like you know the. Um, um, the happening in the border of the free border of the mandible home treatment or surgery if swelling pain at the meal time and you know sialolith meaning like there is calcification blocking the canal for the salivary gland so the treatment for this is boom you need to remove the gland because you cannot treat this one so the bottom line here you must you might see it in a wide range of area extending from the whole ramus anterior to the mental foramen depending on which gland will be affected okay when you see this one in real life in the band, you feel like, oh my goodness, this is artifact. Cannot be real. Like, I, I did see it. I, I, I tried to give you a band for this one, but for AFK, you don't need this one. When coming to ACJ, you will need to discuss this stuff. Lymph node calcification. Lymph node calcification, as you can see, it has a wide range also, but most commonly, it will come at the angle of the mandible and it's cauliflower. And this is the most important part for it. Angle of the mandible, cauliflower. And as you can see, it's outside the boundaries of the mandible itself it might appear here but like because it's happening inside the lymph nodes which usually is inferior to the border of the mandible so most commonly you would see it here and most important factor for it it's a cauliflower at the angle of the mandible calcification due to chronic inflammation irregular sometimes lobular radio opacity maybe cauliflower as we said appears no treatment because like it's, it's not in your scope here, carotid artery calcification, and this one is extremely important and is dangerous. Why? Because, like, think about it. This we speak about the carotid artery. If you have calcification inside carotid artery, this is um, 
very important indication that might that your patient might end up with a stroke because this means like there is a blockage here so this blockage might go inside his brain might go to other organ leading to deep venous thrombosis so when you see this one in uh, a pan in regular pan especially for old pe uh, old people or patients with a history of um, hypertension this is very important you should refer him to his medical doctor immediately because he need to do more tests and you should write in your in your referral letter explaining i just check this at the panoramic x-ray where the patient has history of um, hypertension so he might be at risk so please make your um, investigation about it Calcified arterial plaques near the common carotid bifurcation, approximately a level of C3 to C4, and there's a question asking about, and there's the only one would be longitudinal, irregular heterogeneous radio opacity can be single, multiple, or bilateral. Refer to cardiocerebrovascular evaluation if not under current treatment. This is the one which is important for you to do a treatment. You can see the other one, maybe no treatment, maybe like if patient has sinusitis, you should treat him, but this one is extremely important for you to refer your patient. Then we speak about flip bullies. <clears throat> flip is classified from by within a vascular channel. And as you can see, it has a wide range here, often associated with a vascular malformation or hemangioma. And this one has a very important feature. All the um, radiopacity we speak about before, it's complete radiopacity. Maybe regular, irregular, laminated, non-laminated, but this one will have radiopacity with radiolucency inside it. So you would see like a ring here, ring here, ring here. Radiopacity with radiolucency inside. Why? Because it's inside the vascular channel. Inside the vascular channel, so you can see it, radiopacity, and then the channel of the vascular vein itself giving you this radiolucency. Multiple spherical will define laminated or target light, uh, target like radiopacity. Target like you know for arterial malform, target uh, eye lesion, random uh, distribution. Refer for assessment of suspected vascular malformation. This is you should refer, but this is not as dangerous as the other one. Other one is related directly to a higher risk for your patient to get a stroke or other uh, serious condition. And here, mucus retention pseudocyst. You you remember we speak about the radiopacity inside the maxillary sinus. But this one has a different um, presentation, so pay attention here. It's due to accumulation of mucus resulting from obstruction of some mucosal mucosine gland, not a true cyst. This is why it's pseudocyst, because it's not lined with epithelium. Present as a well-defined, dome-shaped radiopacity protruding from the floor or wall of maxillary sinus. And here comes the difference. So this one will be attached to the floor of the sinus, and will be radio-opaque, but not very radio-opaque, because there's accumulation of mucus inside the maxillary sinus, and it's not laminated, non laminar like you cannot see a lamination around it. The other one would be radio-opaque, not attached to maxillary sinus floor, and it will be in the maxillary sinus itself, and it may be a regular stuff like this, might be laminated, might be not. This one, non-corticated, radiopacity, attach it to the floor of the sinus and again no treatment for this one and then stylohyoid ligament this one is a ligament coming from the um the posterior to the ramus of the mandible you can see radio opacity inside it you can see in one side is normal and in one side you can see it's like ligament would be radio opaque but not very radio opaque when you compare it to the bone here you can see it's radio opacity inside it like resembling of the bone, not like the bone structure, but because of calcification happening inside this one. Calcification of a stylohyoid ligament will define liner radiopacity from the styloid process to a lesser horn of the hyoid muscle, a hyoid bone from here till here. It, it shouldn't be like completely from here to here, but like this is the one giving you the approximate location. It might be here, it might be here, might be extending from here till here. So this one is giving you the approximate location. Normally asymptomatic and require no treatment. And you can see here, it has a different name, Eagle syndrome or carotid artery syndrome, okay? And lastly, this one is not very common, but like um, I think we should know about it, thyroid cartilage. Meaning, you know, uh, beneath the hyoid bone, the th thyroid cartilage, it might have some ossification inside it. It's normal physiological calcification of the laryngeal cartilage. 
um, here have two names, thyroid one, generally only two to three millimeters superior a horn is visible, and the other one, tritrochus, oval, circular, will define the smooth radiopacity between greater horn of the hyoid and the superior horn of the thyroid cartilage. So it might be number one, which is here, or it might be number two, thyroid itself here. And anyway, no clinical significance and no uh, no, uh, no treatment is um, indicated here, but might be confused with choroid calcification, which we said is longitudinal, coming here between two and three, not one and two, uh, between two and three here. And this one is dangerous and it's a longitudinal in manifestation. This one is away between the hyoid uh, bone and between the thyroid cartilage, and it has no clinical significance. So with that being said, I hope you got the concept here. So here we speak about a calcified mass vertically oriented between the third and fourth vertebrae, its carotid calcification. Second question from anatomy. Which of the following statement is true? Special sensation to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue is provided by the lingual nerve. Special sensation to the posterior two-thirds of the tongue is provided by facial nerve. Motor innervation to the tongue is mainly provided by the glossopharyngeal nerve, none of the above. Before we read it and answer it, let's discuss innervation of tongue, and then you can get to conclude. So we are going to uh, divide our tongue to anterior two-third and posterior one-third. And then we are going to divide the innervation to be test sensation, uh, taste and sensation, like taste was like a special sensation, sensation for the hot and cold, and motor which uh, moved the tongue. Anterior two-thirds of the tongue, the taste sensation is coming from the facial nerve. And the sensation, which is like the normal sensation, is coming from V3, which is trigeminal, from the mandibular one. The posterior one-third of the tongue, taste and sensation, both are coming from glossopharyngeal nerve. And then the last one, motor innervation, is coming from hypoglossal nerve. So let's see another picture. Here, sensory innervation, anterior two-thirds of the tongue coming from the V3 via lingual nerve. And then I, I, I think you can relate to this one. Lingual nerve is coming from the mandibular nerve. So we can see in the end, anterior two-thirds of the general sensation is coming from the mandibular nerve, from that trigeminal nerve, which is V3. Special sensation taste coming from the facial nerve via corda tympani, and we speak about this before, corda tympani coming from the facial nerve and jumping over the lingual nerve till it reached the tongue, giving the special sensation with taste sensation. Posterior third of the tongue sensation and taste both coming from glossopharyngeal nerve. And the motor innervation for all the tongue of the, uh, all the muscle of the tongue coming from hypoglossal nerve except palatoglossal is coming from the vagus nerve. I know it's complicated, but you should uh, pay attention to this and you should memorize it because you see question about this uh, a lot. So again, let's try it again. Anterior two thirds of the tongue coming from two. Special sensation, which is like coming to the taste sensation, coming from facial nerve through the corda tympani, which is jumping over the lingual nerve. Anterior two thirds of the tongue, general sensation coming from mandibular nerve via lingual nerve. Posterior one third, both coming from glossopharyngeal, and the muscle of the tongue, which is an intrinsic muscle, genoglossus, hypoglossal, styloglossus, all these muscles coming from hypoglossal nerve, except palatoglossus coming from the vagus nerve. And here, like, um, like recap for everything, and where the muscle is coming from, and the function of each muscle, you can see all from hypoglossal, 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 and palatoglossal mainly coming from vagus nerve. Okay. Should you memorize this part? Yes, sadly. I would like to say though, but yes. Why? Why? I, I will tell you why. Like for hypoglossal uh, muscle, like imagine a question asking about a patient received a trauma to his neck. When he received a trauma to his neck, to the right side, when he's retracting, he, when he's trying to um, get his tongue out, like doing like um, getting his tongue to come out, the tongue is deviated to the right side. Why the tongue is deviated to the right side? As you can see, let's go back to the previous picture, speak about the muscle. Muscle of the tongue, like this is the, like from right side and left side. To the right side have this muscle and left side have the same muscle and they attach it together in the, in the midline. When the hypoglossal nerve is affected, so this muscle cannot move. When this muscle cannot move, think about it this way. When the right muscle cannot move and left muscle can move, so when you protrude your tongue, the tongue will be deviated to the, yes, the affected side. 
but these muscles are not working. So you should know which muscle is doing what, because like when you face with a question, I speak about hypoglossal nerve being affected and patient trying to protrude his tongue, it will be deviated to the right side because the right side is the affected side. And you should know this muscle is doing this one. This muscle is doing this one. I know it's a little um, tricky and little dull to memorize all this anatomy information, but anatomy is important. Why anatomy is important? Because like it gives you the foundation so you can understand surgery. I wouldn't recommend ever to for you study surgery without having solid, solid knowledge in anatomy. Because when you have solid knowledge in anatomy, surgery will be easy, like application for what you know. When you don't have this solid knowledge in anatomy, it will be very hard for you to go with surgery and stuff like this. Anatomy, you can divide it and you do a um, schedule for it to repeat it again, again, again. Go with important topic and then divide it and do it again, again, again. And study with surgery in the same time frame. So you can correlate information, you get the maximum benefit of your study sessions. So what statement is true? Special sensation to anterior third of the tongue is coming from? No, it's coming from the facial. Special sensation to posterior third of the tongue is coming from facial? No, it's coming from the other nerve. Motor innervation is coming from glossopharyngeal? No, it's coming from hypoglossal nerve. Glossopharyngeal is the one for the posterior one third of the tongue, so none of them. Third question from epidemiology. Failing to inform the patient of a separated instrument during endodontic treatment violates which ethical principle? We did a complete lecture about ethical principle and type of the study. You can check it in the um, live session. Go up here in the left side of the screen. You can check the epidemiology session. You can watch it at your convenience. Here I'm going to recap uh, two um, ethic principles which is related to this question. Beneficence, non-maleficence, veracity, justice. So it's not beneficence, not non-maleficence, because beneficence is doing good, but non-maleficence is not doing harm for your patient. So you might be confused between veracity and justice. I cannot blame you. So let's read it together, and then we can come to conclude. Speak first about justice. Justice is fairness. Dentists to treat people fairly, no prejudge. Seek alliance to improve, assess, to care for all. Be fair in dealing with patient. Cannot refuse service based on race, creed, color, gender, sex, nation, and disability. So here, justice is to treat your patient equally. You cannot say because this patient has this color, this patient has this gender, I cannot treat him, this patient has disability, I cannot treat him, I will give him appointment later. So you making difference in the treatment you provide for your patient, so you're violating justice. Dentists should work with physician for patient with disability blood board pathogen. Meaning, if patient coming to you saying, I have TB. No, no, I will not treat you. No, this is not justice. So you abandon your patient here. No, if, he telling, if he's telling you he has TB, if he's telling you he has AIDS, so you should seek um, advice from his medical doctor so you can treat him. And think about it in a basic way. In real life, if a dentist in community in one community, refusing to treat patient with TB, refusing to treat patient with AIDS, what is going to happen? This patient will come to the dentist and he will not tell him. When he will not tell him, so you are putting yourself, your staff, and other patient in your office in danger. So it sounds very fair for you and for your patient, for your community. When your patient telling you, I have this condition, you just need to dig deep with his medical doctor to get the clearance and treat him. When you refuse to treat him, this patient will go to other dentists without telling him, endangering everyone in the office and the community. Emergency sh service should be open to patient and non-patient of the dental office. Meaning a patient in his vacation and coming to your office and you don't take new patient. It's okay, you, you, you are a good dentist, you have a lot of patient waiting in your um, waiting list. But this patient is in pain, you cannot say, no, I cannot treat you, you are not my patient. No, in emergency service, you should provide for him. So if you abandon him, so you violate justice one. So I'm here giving reading and giving you scenarios. So these scenarios can be present in your mind. And when you are faced with a question, so you can answer it. Dentists must report faulty treatment of other dentists to reviewing agency. If you have patient coming from other dentists and this dentist do a faulty treatment, so you should um, like report it. Patients should be informed of their present oral health status without this, uh, um, this bringing the other dentist's work. Meaning, the patient comes to you and he has RCT, and this RCT, you can see a broken file inside it. How you are going to address this situation? 
So you are not going to say, okay, this dentist do a full treatment for you. He left a file here. You should go refer to the orthodontist now. And when did you do it? How come he didn't tell you? No. If you do this and this patient go to court, you are in danger. And the first dentist can um, sue you. Why? Because you should explain in a medical term. You are not here to judge whatever has been done by other dentists. So you should open x-ray, other x-ray with uh, good RCT and telling your patient and comparing between them and telling him this, well, um, did the dentist inform you about this one or he didn't inform you? And then you discuss with him and then you might ask him to go back to the first dentist so you can discuss it. In a professional way, you are not here to judge other dentists. Dentists may making this breaking comments that are not supported or justified, the dentist is under disciplinary proceedings. As I told you, he can sue you. Dentists can consult patients, other dentists, to understand why certain treatment was given. Patients should never be made to explain that they received mistreatment, as we said. Inform patient as truthfulness, inform it, and justifiable. Dentists can be an expert testimony for judge judicial administrative action meaning like if the second patient when the patient come to you and you told him the first dentist didn't tell me and you go to the other dentist and the dentist deny it maybe he didn't um he didn't acquire it and then the patient is asking you to go to the court to give your testimony about it you should go if you don't go you're violating justice unethical for a dentist to have a contingency fee based on a favorable outcome of legislation in exchange for testifying as a dental expert. Meaning like when you go to court, you cannot say to your patient, okay, pay me because I'm going to testify for your case. So that was justice. Let's speak about veracity. Veracity is truthfulness. Communi um, communicate truthfully. So you should communicate with your patient telling him the truth. Respecting the trust in dentist-patient relationship. No deception. You are not going to like... Um, Hide some information, not tell the full truth about his condition, shall not be misleading or false about care. Recommending removing amalgam from a body is unethical and improper, applies to all dental restorative material. So if patient comes to you and he has amazing amalgam staying for a very long time with him, feeling are good, not broken, your patient has no allergy, has no signs of allergy to mercury, and you think, no, man, this like is so old feeling. How come you live with this one? Let's remove all this and give you a new feeling. So here you are violating veracity, because I see some dentists speaking about this one, violating maleficence, maleficence, no, not maleficence or preficence. Here you are violating veracity because you are giving your patient treatment that that he does not need so you mislead you do deception for your patient must probably present fee no overbilling be honest about charging with insurance company government etc so if you increase the payment for your patient because like he appears rich or this patient has insurance which can pay you good so you increase the fee so you are violating veracity why i'm saying this out loud because sometimes you're confusing this with justice we speak about justice now we speak about veracity so changing amalgam veracity uh, increasing fees is veracity. What else? Cannot increase fee on patient with insurance. Dentist full fee is what he charged. Someone without insurance. Should also be fee that an insurance company knows about must report proper treatment dates and treatment um, renders. Do not provide unnecessary service. Dentist must disclose monetary interest with product service in form of promotion material or presentation. Some dentists are selling a toothbrush in their office. So they should sell the uh, toothbrush at the same price it's been uh, sold in other um, clinic or other pharmacy you cannot increase the fee because it's sold in a dental clinic must use a uh, drug house intended do not exploit trust for financial gain do not misrep product value you not uh, this one will give you bleaching in one minute no must let the patient know if the product is available elsewhere and any financial incentives. Must probably present self-training, etc. Like in your office, you should have your uh, certificate hang it on, your continuous education hang it on, so your patient can see it and trust you. Not allowed to advertise patient in any form in false manner. No misrepresenting of facts. No omitting fact. No unreal expectation. No saying product is superior to other dentist product. So no omitting facts, meaning this one. When the patient has a broken file and you don't tell him, so violate veracity. 
it didn't violate justice. Justice is a different discipline. Here we speak about veracity to be truth, to be truthful, to speak with your patient in a true way. You are not going to deceive him. You are not going to increase fee for insurance. You are not going to sell him something cannot be can be sold in other location and reduce fee. You cannot give him product saying this product will give you like blah 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 in few minutes. Like no, you should be respecting the relationship between dentist and the patient. So here, if you didn't tell your patient about separate instrument, which ethical principle you violate is veracity, not justice. It is veracity. Next question from pediatric. During try-in of a stylistic crown, the crown could not be fully seated. Which of the following is the most likely cause? Remaining bulge of the serous tooth, presence of definitive finish line, drifting of adjacent teeth. So before we get the answer, let's speak about stylistic crown because it's important. And they see a lot of dentists has misconcept about it. So let's read it from textbook so you can get the knowledge and then answer the question. So here we're gonna speak about stellar C crown for posterior teeth. So what's the indication for this? Restation for primary or young permanent? Because I see a lot of resistance when I'm saying permanent teeth can be used, can uh, give benefit of stellar C crown. And let me speak about this situation. If you have 11 years old, a female with four six, which is totally broken, and you are, you are going to do RST for this tooth. So you did RST. And as you can think, 11 years old, destroyed first permanent water. So this patient has horrible um, oral hygiene measures. So it, she is in a high risk for caries. So how you are going to restore this tooth until you give her the full crown? Because, you know, we cannot give um, custom made crown like PFM crown unless the jaw is completely modeled and the growth is stopped. So at least 16 or 18 years old. So from 11 to 16 years old, how this patient is going to survive? Here, you can use C crown for permanent teeth. So young permanent teeth with extensive or multiple carious lesion, so you can use C crown. I hope this is clear. Restoration for hyperplastic primary or permanent teeth that cannot be adequately restored with bonded restoration. Restoration for teeth with hereditary anomalies, intrusions, imperfecta, imperfecta, imperfecta. Restoration of uh, palpotomized, like palpotomy or papectomy. A primary or young permanent teeth when there is increased danger of fracture of the remaining coronal structure and here it here every tooth with papotomy papectomy the best restoration after papotomy papectomy is stellar crown you don't uh, say um composite you don't say amalgam you don't say no no no, no. after papotomy after papectomy for uh, permanent teeth for um primary teeth the best restoration is a stellar crown Restoration of fractured teeth, restoration for primary teeth to be used as abutment for appliance, attachment for the habit breaker and orthodontic appliance. This one, you know, when you do a band and loop or when you are doing to do lingual arch to give space maintainer, so you can use the C crown for this one. Okay. And here the C crown tooth is broken. So we're going to give full coverage, which is going to cover the tooth till it shed out like the primary tooth or till uh, the patient growth is completed. So you can do the crown for the permanent teeth. Children at high risk for caries, um, the stellar C crown is extremely durable restriction. Children with extensive decay, large lesions, or multiple surface lesions in primary molar should be treated with stellar C crown because of the protection from future decay provided by their fracture, their feature of full coverage, and their increased durability and longevity. A strong consideration should be given to use of a stellar C crown in children who require general anesthesia. Finally, a strong uh, argument for the use of a C crown restoration in its cost effectiveness based on its durability and longevity. So in English, here he speaks about if your patient has high risk, an uncompetitive patient, are you going to give him GA to do treatment? Please do a C crown for him to save yourself and save him because this patient will come back and you cannot treat him because he's uncooperative. So cut it short. Give him a C crown to make good and speak about like um, financial is good because like you're making your patient pay more now but you are going to save him not to go to GE again okay and here the shape of a C crown preparation for the tooth a local anesthetic should be administrated and rubber dam placed as for other restorative procedure 
The proximal surface are reduced using number 690. You don't need to know this one, but like you start from the proximal surface. Care must be taken not to damage adjacent to surface during the proximal, a wood in which may be placed tightly between the surface being reduced and adjacent surface to provide a slight separation between the teeth for better access. So rubber dam, which starts from proximal surface. Near vertical reduction are made on the proximal surface and carried gingerly until the contact with adjacent tooth is broken. So you start from the coronal part going down until the surface, the contact area is broken. Explorer can be passed freely between the prepared tooth and the adjacent tooth. The gingival margin, and this is important, the gingival margin of preparation on the proximal surface should be smooth, feathered edge with no ledge or shoulder present. So you can understand from this line. We are not going to do a finish line. We are just going to break the contact area and making sure it's feather edge finish line. I cannot say finish line. Feather edge area with no ledge or shoulder present in this area. The cusp and enclosure portion of the tooth may then be reduced with number 69 per revolving at high speed. The general contour of the occlusal surface is followed and approximately one millimeter of clearance with opposing teeth is required. So the minimum is one. Maybe optimum speak about 1.5, but like the minimum is one. So you put a rubber dam, which you go the proximal surface first. You don't, you just con breaking the contact area. You're not going to do a finish line, just feather edge and the occlusal surface be cleared by minimum one millimeter. As you can see here, rubber dam, you're going to the proximal surface first, break the contact area here, break the contact area here, and then do a closer reduction. And then the lastly is down rounding of the line angle. Roundation of line angle is very important. See here, line angle is very sharp. Here he's doing roundation for the line angle because this is very important for you. So you cannot have stress um, concentration area in this part will lead to the stress more in the cement, breakage of the cement, failure of your restoration. Then the number 69 bear at high speed may also be used to remove all sharp line angle and point angle. It's usually not necessary to reduce the buckle. Yeah, this is important. It's usually not necessary to reduce the buckle or lingual surface. In fact, it's desirable to have an undercut on the surface to aid in retention of the contoured crown. Um, I know some of you uh, hearing this lecture did do some sassy crown. The criteria for your style C crown to be tight and to be fit on the um, B2 crown. I remember we used to go from the buckle side, you put it from the buckle side and then push it to the lingual side. When you do this one, you hear a click sound. You hear a click sound. This click sound, or maybe you go from lingual, go to buckle. This click sound, meaning your style C crown has like go through the undercut and the bulging from the buckle side or the lingual side, this undercut to engage it so your crown is tight and stay in. That's why we should use the smallest crown. And you can see in the next slide, we're going to use a smallest crown fit because if you're using the bigger crown, you have a space. And you think about it, the C crown should be tight inside your patient mouth. If you are using excess cement, you it might work for a few hours, it might work for a few days, but then the patient, you know kids like a lot, um, they have tendency to eat sticky food like um, um, chocolate stuff like this. So if you have cement, you gaining your retention of your crown from the cement, it might break. But when you gain your retention from the like um, using the undercut of the crown and you want this bulge to be engaged under the finish line uh, above the finish line between the finish line and the cruda surface, so you have higher chance for this crown to stay in your patient mouth. It's desirable to have an undercut on the surface, buccal and lingual, to aid in the retention of the contoured crown. In some cases, however, it may be necessary to reduce a distinct buccal bulge, particularly on the first primary molar. So, specifically first primary molar, you might need to reduce it a little. If any carious dentin remain after these steps in crown preparation are completed, is excavated next. In the event that the vital pulp exposure is encountered, a papotomy procedure is usually carried out. So, we speak about the criteria itself. Selection, the smallest crown that completely covers the preparation should be chosen. Speeding has advocated adhering to two important principles that will consistently to produce well adapted size crown. First, the operator must establish the correct occlusal gingival crown length 
Second, the crown margin should be shaped circumferentially to allow the natural contour of the two schmaz and gingiva. So, closer clearance is very important. Here, I speak about 0.5 to 1 millimeter a closer clearance, and the margin of the crown to be fitting on the end of the crown and the gum to be coming over it. So, as we said before, you do um, proximal surface clearance, closer clearance. You make sure your finish line is clean with nothing over it, and you do roundation of the line angle, and then put the crown. If you see the undercut is too big, especially for the buckle side of the first primary molar, you might reduce it, but you not you you do you do not kill it. You, we need this one because this one is bulging, giving you more attention for your crown. A scratch mark of the crown at the level of the free margin of the gingival tissue. A dentist can remove the crown and determine whether additional metal must be um, cut away with number 11 uh, carved shear or rotating stone. So after you're doing this, as we said, like first first criteria when you're checking the um, size of the crown you are going to use to check occlusal, occlusal, gingival, occlusal um, distance, and then you check your margin. So after you do it, if the occlusal, if the margin is good, but the occlusal is like little high, you can cut with a scissor from here, and a scratch is made at the level of the free margin of the gingiva as an aid determining whether additional metal must be removed. So you do a scratch here when you put your uh, crown. So you can see the crown is little high, but like it's fitting on your tooth. So you can use a scissor to cut it from here. And then a curved beak plier can be cut and contouring the crown from this side. You make sure the crown is fitting and you hear this click sound for you to make sure your crown is in a good shape. So let's go back to the question. Here, remaining bulge of the serious teeth. So, when your crown is not seated, the crown could not be seated fully. So, the problem here, remaining bulge of the serious teeth, presence of definitive finish line. No, we said we are not going to do a finish line. Drifting of adjacent teeth. This is not happening for primary teeth because, like primary teeth, you do botomy now, you do salacy now. You do restoration now, you do salacy crown now. So, this drifting is for permanent teeth, it's not for the uh, primary teeth and sassy crown. I hope this concept is clear for you. And finally, I didn't mention this in the slide. You are going to cement it using uh, glass hammer cement. Why? Because the glass hammer cement is for the ride and is good for the patient as a um, as like um, like because your patient has a high risk caries. So you, we could get benefit from the fluoride coming from glass hammer cement. And the most important one to get the bulge and to hear this click sound so you are engaging the under uh, the undercut and you have a good retention here for your patient last question from operative the patient is to undergo root canal treatment of tooth 21 and tooth 21 has extensive mesial lingual and distal caries so this tooth is going to receive root canal treatment and this has extensive caries mesial lingual distal like everywhere which of the following is considered to be the most appropriate foundation restoration prior to placement of crown and tooth 2-1? So here you speak about upper anterior tooth, has a case, mesial, distal, lingual. So, and you want to do root canal treatment, like it's done. You are going to do root canal treatment for this tooth. So, what's the foundation before you do the crown for this tooth? So let's read. Composite buildup with no post. Fiber post and composite, metal post and composite, fiber post and amalgam, metal post and amalgam. I think this last two option like so you cannot th think about amalgam in anterior teeth. Metal post and composite in anterior teeth, yeah, it might be, but like it's not very aesthetical good for your patient. It might appear if you do zirconia crown, it might appear from the crown. So we're going to avoid this one. So here we are between composite build up with no post and fiber post and composite core. And let me give you a reference here, speak about the post criteria, when to use post or not. In anterior teeth, if no crown is required, post is generally unnecessary. If a crown is necessary, a post is generally required. Posterior teeth, crown generally required. And I would like you not to have a prejudge, like not every posterior teeth with RST require crown, not every anterior teeth require a crown and require a post. And we'll give you another scenario. Like if your patient receives a trauma for his upper anterior teeth, and he comes to you after two or three months, and this tooth is necrotic. This tooth has, um, like inside the fracture, or this tooth maybe has, like some fracture in the labial side. So why you are going to, like you are going to do root canal treatment because this tooth is dead, but why you are going to do a crown for this tooth? 
why you are going to do a post for this tool. No, you don't need for this one. Because you are going to do a lingual access to, to reach the pulp and do Rukna treatment. So the tool structure mostly are still present. So you don't need to do a core, you don't need to you don't need to do to bring a post, you don't need to give a crown. So the criteria here speak about the remaining tooth structure. In anterior teeth, if we're going to do a crown, post is uh, recommended. If a crown is necessary, post is generally required. Yeah, if no crown, no post. Posterior teeth. Molar teeth with a thick wood pulp chamber do not require a post. What the meaning of a thick wood pulp chamber? Like you can think about it. Like if you did Rukna treatment in a tooth which which has like one wall missing, like mesial wall missing, distal wall missing, so it's good. Like because you have a thick wood pulp chamber. But if you have mesial wall and lingual wall missing, or distal and buccal wall missing, so pulp chamber here is not adequate because like two walls of a pulp chamber are gone. If one wall is gone, yeah, maybe you can uh, get away with this one. But if two walls are gone, so pulp chamber isn't adequate here, so here you require a post. Molar teeth with an adequate pulp chamber may require a post because I won't explain this adequate pulp chamber because like it makes no sense. Like every tooth has pulp chamber. So what's the meaning of adequate in uh, adequate pulp chamber? He speak about the remaining walls. Maxillary bicuspid generally require a post, like a uh, uh, upper premolars, mandibular bicuspid require independent consideration. So again, you speak about the surface. Uh, if you have two wall missing, so you are going to do a post for lower premolars. If you have one wall missing and lower premolars, generally you don't need a post. But for maxillary bicuspid, generally require a post. Why? Because the maxillary premolar has um, weird uh, geometry because like the mesiodistal width is very narrow comparing to the buccolingual width. So the tooth like is narrow, like the buccolingual is wide and means distal is narrow. So this means like whatever core you are going to put is very hard for you to contain the core inside the pulp chamber. So you need a post to make sure this post will give a retention for your core. And this is the uh, most important or, or the function, the function of a post to give retention for your core. So if you cannot get retention from a deco pulp chamber, so you are entitled to a post. If you can do it, it's not necessary. Now let me give you a guideline here. If you have lower molar, you did Rukna treatment, and you have a deco pulp chamber. So what is the best restriction to be done for this one? So this restriction we speak about, you use a round bear to remove two millimeter of gutta perca inside the canal, and you condense amalgam inside it, and you build the tooth with amalgam. So here is not a post on core, it's not a bin, it's, it's totally different. It's not like, because like it's confusing, you might think it's post and core or amalgam post. No, you cannot say amalgam post because you are just doing two millimeter in the orifice and you um, fill it with amalgam and you fill your whole tooth with amalgam because this tooth has a deco pulp chamber. So here the question is speak about anterior teeth with extensive frustration. So we're going to go use fiber post and composite core to save this tooth. That's all for today. I hope this question um, give you some concept. I'm really sad we didn't have any management question, but like, ah, I love management so much. But like, uh, I believe I give you management a lot in the few um, previous um, newsletter. So I will stop management a little bit till we go management again. I hope that's will be beneficial for you. Feel free to share this video with your friends. Um, you can download PDF and have it and share it with your friends. Give me your feedback and see you next Sunday.